The Joker, Lex Luthor, The Riddler, Black Mask, all larger than life comic book villains with one thing in common, no superpowers. But what they lack in the ability to fly, read minds, or shoot lightning, they make up for in ruthlessness, cunning, and downright evil genius. And the real life figure we're talking about today is no exception. He's been involved in everything from massacres to movies, from buying missiles made by the world's worst dictatorships to selling guns to mysterious private buyers. That's right. When it comes to putting deadly weapons in the hands of sinister people, he's a true kingpin. Meet infamous international arms dealer Mick Ranger, Britain's real-life supervillain, and the man The Guardian calls a global dealer in death. You're probably wondering, if this guy's so prolific, how come I've never heard of him before? And the answer is simple, because he doesn't want you to. Despite being involved in weapons deals worth millions of dollars, Mick Ranger is an incredibly secretive person. Wannabe villains like Martin Screlly, the currently imprisoned pharma bro who hiked up the prices of life-saving drugs and swindled money from investors, post about themselves constantly in hopes of cultivating a fearsome reputation. But true masterminds like Ranger operate mostly in the shadows. It's next to impossible to find a current photograph of Ranger online. All we know about his physical appearance comes from an interview with Vice he gave in 2016. Ranger is described as a tall man, often dressed in black clothes, with his dark hair pulled back in a ponytail. While we know about a lot of his more high-profile deals, especially those that fell through, so much of Ranger's life is still shrouded in secrecy. Where he was born and how he spent his early years are a mystery to us. But like all good bad guys, we do have his villainous origin story. According to Ranger himself, he was working at an auto body shop as a young man when a police firearms instructor entered the building. Ranger made polite conversation with the officer until his job came up, and Ranger told him that he always had an interest in guns, but never had a chance to use them. The officer said that he'd be happy to take Mick down to the range and let him try his hand at target shooting. As it turns out, Ranger enjoyed it. In fact, Ranger really, really enjoyed it. That nameless police firearms instructor had no idea what he just unleashed. It wasn't long after that that Ranger created his new company, Imperial Defense Services, and began selling guns across the UK. In case this career trajectory wasn't sinister enough already, the logo for Mick Ranger's shiny new company was literally a dagger. Before long, he'd become the UK's biggest independent firearms dealer. Naturally, like all supervillains, Ranger needed a lair. He chose Frog's Hall, an impressive-looking farmhouse on the outskirts of the village of Takeley, Essex, a tiny township with a population of less than 4,000. The 1980s was a major growth period for Mick Ranger and Imperial Defense Services. Among his proudest achievements was an exclusivity deal with Chinese weapons manufacturer Norinco, making him the sole importer of the popular Type 56 assault rifle, a Chinese copy of the perennial AK-47. However, this point of pride would soon become one of Ranger's earliest shames, as he sold a batch of Type 56 to Westbury Guns, a gun shop in Wiltshire. In 1987, a man named Michael Robert Ryan bought one of those Soviet ripoffs and would go on to use it to murder eight people. Michael Ryan is infamous in the UK as the perpetrator of the Hungerford Massacre, a series of 16 murders committed on August 19, 1987, in the small town of Hungerford, Berkshire. He murdered various people across town with a number of handguns and semi-automatic rifles, before taking his own life during a police standoff. Half of everyone who was murdered that day was killed with the Type 56 Norinco rifle imported to the UK by Mick Ranger. In that instant, Ranger's perfectly cultivated secrecy collapsed, as journalists suddenly became aware of the man who'd sold Britain's deadliest mass killer, his favorite rifle. This particular tragedy also ended up hurting Mick in another significant way. It led to the UK tightening gun laws around the rifles that Mick was making a fortune off selling. The Firearms Act of 1988 strangled a lot of Mick's business opportunities in the UK, and more legislation that came in after gun crimes in the early 90s put him at a serious disadvantage. At this point, a lot of lesser evildoers would have given up and returned to the auto body shop, but not Mick Ranger. With the advent of the 90s, Imperial Defense Services went global. While political events in the UK were making it harder for him to make money, the situation over the Eastern Bloc was about to play right into his hands. The collapse of the Soviet Union caused a chain reaction of other communist government collapses across Eastern Europe, leading to political disarray and a lot of corrupt government officials wanting to make a quick buck. Mick Ranger loved these post-communist states because their focus on industrialization and mass production had left them with massive weapon surpluses. And a large weapon surplus that a country was eager to get rid of was Mick's bread and butter. He'd buy huge quantities of surplus weapons and military equipment from these countries and sell them to eager and often dangerous buyers from across the globe for a profit. But it wasn't just Eastern Europe that became Ranger's new stomping ground. 
As his company's website boasts, our business is truly global, with no geographical limitations, therefore no country or its needs are of difficulty to us. There are Imperial Defense Service offices or agents in Bulgaria, Cyprus, Nigeria, Australia, South Africa, and Vietnam. And yeah, you heard that right, this evil organization has its own website, but we'll get to that later. Mick Ranger slithered back into the headlines in 2002 when he made his way to Phnom Penh, Cambodia. It doesn't take an expert in international relations to know that Cambodia has had a fraught political history, particularly involving US bombing runs under Nixon and the genocide perpetrated by the Khmer Rouge under dictator Pol Pot. An unstable political situation and a history of violence spells great business to Mick Ranger, and he was eager to make a big purchase from the Cambodian government. The deal was simple. He'd give the government a number of Land Rover SUVs in exchange for over 100,000 used handgun and M16 magazines, which had a market value of around $1 per unit. To Ranger, this was a bargain. However, he found himself disappointed when Cambodian co-minister of defense T-Bon turned him down. They had no interest in making deals with such a sketchy character, especially without the approval of the EU. Ranger was furious. He made his way to the office of David De Beer, program manager for the European Union Assistance on Curbing Small Arms and Light Weapons in Cambodia program. He ordered De Beer to approve the deal, but when De Beer told him he didn't have the authority, Ranger stormed off in a rage. While not every job was a success, Mick and Imperial Defense Services Limited had their fingers in a lot of pies. He was selling weapons to private companies, governments, and police forces from the US to Nepal. The company even had a side business selling weapons and equipment to movies and TV shows for props for extra authenticity. The James Bond movie Goldeneye is one notable example. Any AK-47s you see in that movie come straight from Mick Ranger. Like every dubious dealer of dangerous products, Mick had set up bank accounts and shell companies around the world to help him do business without intrusion. This included Hong Kong Commercial, a business he set up to easily operate in Asia, established in the name of his Vietnamese girlfriend. However, the true genius of Ranger's work was that most of it was technically not illegal. Even though it was undeniably immoral, Ranger was fastidious in making sure that everything up front was legitimate and that no crimes committed with weapons he brokered could ever be associated with him. After the incident in Phnom Penh, the nature of Ranger's sinister work was once again coming to light. In 2003, The Guardian wrote an expose and performed a sting operation against Imperial Defense Services just to see how far they'd go. A reporter posed as a representative from a defense company based in Syria working along the Iraqi border. They wanted a shipment of AK-47s and landmines from Mick to help secure oil fields in the region, making it clear that the weapons may end up being used in Iraq, despite UN sanctions forbidding such a deal. Having been in the business for over a decade at that point, Ranger was crafty about the arrangement. He showed a clear willingness to make the sale, but only if Iraq wasn't mentioned at any point in the deal, especially in the end-user documentation. He wanted to retain plausible deniability. Once again, Mick Ranger remained lawful, but awful. It would almost be another decade of dangerous arms deals before Ranger finally stepped over the line. In the late 2000s, Ranger was working with the South Korean government to purchase a missile system from North Korea just so they could see what the DPRK was working with. After closing this 5 million pound deal though, Mick began to pursue a working relationship with North Korean agents, working for the Korea Mining Development Trading Corporation or COMID. In that moment, he'd gone from working with a maniac who killed 16 people to a regime that killed and enslaved millions. Talk about a promotion. Getting into a business partnership with North Korea was a huge boost for Ranger and his company. Due to trade embargoes from the UN, their terrible reputation on the international stage, and generally poor quality military equipment, very few nations wanted to deal with the DPRK directly. An independent broker like Mr. Ranger was a dream come true, and he already had his first big score lined up selling a huge shipment of North Korean surface-to-air missiles to the nation of Azerbaijan. He'd even throw in 100,000 pistols imported from his contacts in the US just to sweeten the deal. However, there'd been an embargo on exporting arms to Azerbaijan since 1992, after their questionable military dealings in Armenia. But Mick Ranger wasn't about to let something as little as legality get in the way of what could be the biggest deal of his life. He operated as one of his shell companies, the aforementioned Hong Kong Commercial, and used fake emails and identities for many of the on-paper transactions. This was where Ranger's greed finally caught up to him. The deal eventually fell through, and when he returned to England, he was arrested at Stansted Airport. In 2011, he was convicted of violating the Azerbaijan trading arms embargo, and spent a mere three and a half years in prison for his troubles. Considering some of the incredibly shady people he sold guns to, it's likely he's responsible for a lot more harm than we'll ever know. These days, in a state he describes as semi-retired, 
he keeps an even lower profile, worrying vengeful North Korean agents will want his blood for the Azerbaijan deal falling through. For a man who, by his own admission, has done the dirty business of arms dealing in over 150 countries, Mick Ranger is still a remarkably secretive person. The real-life supervillain has somehow managed to keep his face a secret, despite everything he's been involved in. But in one final strange twist on the life and career of Mick Ranger, you can still find the web archive of his old company website which looks like it was probably designed by his teenage nephew. Here, you can find everything from guns to grenades to what seems like the offer of mercenary services for, quote, peacekeeping missions or similar types of work. And perhaps the most sinister of all, a passage under a section marked Disposal reads, While small arms and ammunition are our main item of interest, we can normally find eager new owners for any surplus defense item, from the smallest components to main battle tanks, aircraft, and even ocean vessels. And as long as there are eager new owners out there, people like Mick Ranger won't be going away anytime soon. Now check out incredible story of a British stockbroker who became a drug kingpin in the United States, and the coder who became a criminal mastermind, Paul Aru, for more stories on real-life supervillains.